Hello, welcome back to my YouTube station for part three of the series on internalized homophobia. The last two portions were kind of more introductory and one was very more kind of chill and also about the importance of spirituality to counteract internalized homophobia. This one is going to be a bit more serious. It's actually kind of more directed for students, instructors, people in courses where they're learning about how to treat LGBT clients. There's a whole domain of study called LGBTQ Affirmative Theory and Practice. At Antioch University, we founded the nation's first LGBT specialization in clinical psychology. So it's gonna be a little bit of a literature review. I hope it appeals to everybody. And I'm actually only gonna to touch on a few central topics, but if you're more interested, I promise I will be creating a, more, a teachable for those more interested in serious study. I also wanted to ask you a few questions to start. Maybe you could respond in the comments section. What's internalized homophobia mean to you? What do you think it does to your psychology? And any stories you have about how you feel internalized homophobia has impacted you in terms of how you love, how you feel about yourself, how you talk to yourself, your use of uh, substances, and the ways you do or don't take care of yourselves when you have sex. So those are some questions, and I'm, I'm love to hear your responses. So right now we're gonna dive into the uh, literature, and I'm so excited to tell you the very first piece, which I believe, I could be wrong, came out in 1982. Don't forget the field of affirmative psychology began really just a few years after the gay liberation movement when therapists were strong enough to actually say, fuck it, I want to come out to myself and I even want to come out to my clients. All of the theories got refried to make sure they were LGBT affirmative. And the most important thing was we must not pathologize homosexuality, bisexuality at all. It's as natural and indigenous and valuable as any other kind of sexual feeling or gender identification. Still a big deal that we really wanna move away from pathologizing how we love and think of it either as socially constructed or as inborn, but at the same time, you can't touch it with pathology, okay? So that's very important. So um, after the first sort of uh, LGBT affirmative studies came out, I think it was Don Clark's uh, big book in 1977, Loving Someone Gay. I think it was the book by the first out gay psychologist then um, in 1982, this guy, Alan Malion, wrote an important paper. It's in this book, which you kind of can check it out if you want. Affirmative Dynamic Psychotherapy with Gay Men by Carlton Cornett. Um, and in this book is this article, which I have always loved. And I won't go through the whole piece because maybe that's for the teachable. But the name of the article is Psychotherapeutic Implications of Internalized Homophobia in Gay Men, 1982. That's pretty early. Alan Malion. Now, unfortunately, it only talks about gay men. A lot of other folks would extrapolate this to lesbians and bisexuals. When we talk about trans folk, we can talk about maybe internalized homophobia and internalized transphobia. That should be a subsequent conversation. We get here this really interesting synthesis of psychodynamic work with gay-centered theory. Psychodynamic, for those of you who may not be studying clinical psychology, is one of the fields that help us work with our clients, but it's also a philosophy of life. Psychodynamic means that there's two levels of the mind, at least the conscious and the unconscious, and that they work in dynamic opposition and in conflict until we learn how to work with them together. So, for example, when we think about trauma, all that trauma is in the unconscious and very, very far away. We don't remember it, it's split off, it's dissociated. When we talk about the conscious, it's how we go about our lives. We could be dissociated, we could be split off. So it's very interesting when all of a sudden the trauma arises at some point in our lives. We go, what the heck happened? I, I don't recognize myself. That's psychodynamic. So that a lot of our mental life is actually non-conscious. It's in the unconscious. Still a really important idea. A lot of folks haven't caught up with it. And actually a lot of therapists themselves are not psychodynamics. But anyway, the really cool thing that he does here with internalized homophobia in gay men is he demonstrates that these 
um, problems, we internalize these ideas about who we are from our parents and our society, even before we have organized a sexual orientation. It's that early. And what it does as we're emerging our sexual orientation throughout the course of early childhood, we're dealing with so much shame that the ego fragments. And the problem of internalized homophobia in gay men, as Alan Malian talks about it, is it delays our progress, it inhibits our ways of making uh, connections, and then we get this very powerful inner attacker. He doesn't call it that, but that's one way of understanding that uh, the internalized homophobia um, uh, compromises ego, uh, ego identity and um, psychological integrity. Ego, by the way, in psychology doesn't mean what we think about it in the street, which is, oh, he has such a big fat ego, or she is all into her shit. Ego in clinical psychology is that very delicate but important aspect of the mind that hovers over all our feelings and all our intentions and all our motives and is able to referee and regulate our relations with internal feelings, dynamics, instincts, and outer ones. Actually, in clinical psychology, we actually want to strengthen the ego. So if internalized homophobia is attacking ego integrity, it's not a great thing. It means that the individual is fairly uh, fragmented. Um, boy, I could say I could talk about this article a lot and I want to move on. But what I like about this paper is it talks about four phases of treatment. One has to do with just making the alliance. Two has to do with some type of education about what actually is normative homosexual development. Number three has to do with um, the intimacy issue between me and the client and the client and other people. Often in therapy, the client-therapist relationship is a petri d for intimacy issues. So all of their feelings of being rejected and hated and scorned will come out in the therapy that's called the transference. And part three, he talks about a spiritual stage, which is so cool that here's this clinical psychologist saying that if you work through your internalized homophobia, you feel so good about yourself, it spiritualizes your feelings about being gay. I love this. Lesbian Psychology's Explorations and Challenges, 1987, just a few years later. And here's an important article by Liz Margolis, Martha Becker, and Carla Jackson Brewer on internalized homophobia, semicolon, identifying and treating the oppressor within. It's actually a little more humanistic title. Isn't that great? Identifying and treating the oppressor within. Here, this article is really saying, we call it internalized homophobia, but it's much better to imagine that we've integrated the bullies in our imagination without being aware of it. And they're fucking us from the inside out. And how can we become more aware of what that voice is doing and actually stand up against? Talks about uh, the types of ways that internalized homophobia might impact lesbians. You might hear a client saying, I hate myself for being lesbian. You might see a lot of emphasis on passing, on acting straight. You might see some discomfort with obvious fags and dykes, um, restricted attractions to women who are available, but also going after unavailable women, short-term relationships, and erotophobia. This is a really important discussion here that uh, for lesbians in this article, internalized homophobia might make women hate their, hate their bodies. Also, uh, to the extent that it raises issues around eating disorders and substance abuse, the greater the internalized homophobia, the greater the need for self-soothing. Eventually, the field moves away from psychoanalytic, psychodynamic approaches for different reasons. I think a lot of people still have the idea that a Freudian approach was homophobic, that's actually inaccurate. As you see, a lot of analysts were developing a lesbian and gay affirmative Freudian approach, but people still don't know that even in schools today. They don't actually know that, but it's very important. You can be psychoanalytic slash Freudian and be very LGBT positive. In uh, 2000, we're jumping ahead a little bit, this guy Ian Williamson wrote a paper uh, called A Critical Review internalized homophobia and health issues affecting lesbians and gay men, where he went over the literature up to date and was able to see that uh, there's actually been a disagreement about the uses of 
internalized homophobia because some people were thinking it over pathologizes queer people that there's something wrong internally in them and it's much more likely that actually it's outer stigma and outer institutional oppression that they're really contending with so he goes back and forth and he says well actually it's probably good to have both ideas and he does a very nice literature review of articles up to date. And more importantly, he's also able to give us a sense as how internalized homophobia is studied. There are all these scales that ask questions about how you feel about yourself, how you think other people perceive you, and you're able actually through analyzing and doing a statistical analysis of those scales, actually be able to quantitate what is a person's relationship to their self-esteem as queer and how they're fighting internalized homophobia. Here, this article is going to be linked in the description section. Three, the name of the book is Psychological Perspectives on Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Experiences, edited by Linda D. Garnitz and Douglas C. Kimmel. It came out in 2003, and there's an important paper in here called Minority Stress and Mental Health in Gay Men by Elon H. Meyer. And here he says that um, we really need to be studying three different variables. We want to get a really good idea of how gay men or anyone else is being impacted. And he comes up with three. One is internalized homophobia. Two is perceived stigma. So that's not the same thing as internalized homophobia. It's the kind of thing where let's say you go out in public and you're intuitively perceiving the stigma against you. Let's say you walk into an elevator and it's a frat party and all these straight guys walk in the elevator and the whole elevator goes quiet. And the third topic is discrimination and violence. So has the individual experienced discrimination? Has the individual experienced violence? Was there bullying? Was the person fag bashed? So those three issues, internalized homophobia, perceived stigma, and discrimination, violence, all get studied together separately with these different scales and then get analyzed to understand all of the different levels that have been impacting the individual. For some reason, and I think I understand why, the concept of internalized homophobia does not enter into the field of social sciences. There were, there's like been four or five of these huge, big books, largely compilations of different kinds of essays that concern people like me who are instructors, wanting to teach student therapists how to work with the LGBT community, which is amazing. There's now finally a social science literature. But if you go through the pages of this, and I have, you won't find any mention of internalized homophobia, even though it's available in other areas. I think the reason for that is twofold. One, social science seems to be moving away from a focus on the unconscious. I just think there's different reasons for that. It could be that the researchers are more extroverted in their orientation. It could be that they're not been psychoanalytically analyzed, which is a completely inappropriate thing for me to be saying. It just might be also that it's easier to quantify things that are in the conscious and not so much in the unconscious. I think it's a real problem because I think that if you really want to help queer people, it's very important to do both, to have a social scientist attitude but to also appreciate the mystery, the sublimity, the numinosity of the unconscious, we actually might imagine from the previous YouTube I made that, that queer people have a very powerful and magical relationship to the unconscious. So for LGBT affirmative theory and practice in a mainstream way not to be studying that is an oversight in my opinion. I also believe it's influenced by the um, critique of essentialism that came out in the 90s. There was an argument that to say that gayness or lesbianness or bi-ness was innate was an error. To say that there was any continuity between gay people today and gay people in ancient history was an error. All of that I'd like to actually rectify and create more of a unification. Now it just so happens I did a more thorough literature review and I saw that there were tons of articles focusing on studying internalized homophobia, but in other countries. The moderating effect of filial piety on the relationship between perceived public stigma and internalized homophobia, a national survey of the Chinese LGB population. In 2020, the relationship between masculinity and internalized homophobia 
amongst Australian gay men. In 2022, mental health and life satisfaction on Chilean gay men and lesbian women, the role of perceived sexual stigma internalized to homophobia and community connectedness. So you see there's all kinds of ways that this area works. Research is still being done. So I'd love to go into those papers and how they're marrying internalized homophobia, which is a psychodynamic term. Psychodynamic really means things that are inside that can't be seen, that can't be studied by typical scientific exploration, can only be known by its effects. And uh, more social science work, which is studying perhaps more what consciousness. Thank you so much for coming to this much more kind of scholarly and professorial exposition on the available literature on internalized homophobia. I hope it was interesting for you to see how internalized homophobia has to do with the soul to a certain extent and how LGBT affirmative social science moves away from the study of the soul, how that's useful, how that's not useful. In the comment section, let me know how you found this material. Was it interesting? Did it help you in your studies? If you're a therapist or if you're just a general person and you want all of the ideas that I have and I have developed over the last 30 years to help you in your own therapy, in your own inner work, in your own personal development. If you have some time to write down how internalized homophobia is impacting you and you want to send that to me, I'd love to hear from you. Please put it in the comments. Thank you so much. Don't forget to smash that like button and hit the subscribe button and then you'll get more news and information about the next video, which I believe is a series of interviews with treaters and just regular people about their views and ideas on internalized homophobia. Thank you so much for coming. I so appreciate you.